Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Albert Park. I'm the chief economist at the Asian Development Bank, and I want to welcome you to today's ADB Asian Impact webinar on recovering learning losses from the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, this webinar is one a piece of a consistent effort we're making at ADB this year to really draw urgent attention to the challenge of the learning crisis and the learning losses experienced during the pandemic, which we think that governments throughout the region really need to pay uh, attention to and design effective policies uh, to address the challenge um, this fall, especially as kids return uh, to school in many countries. Um, to help support that effort, uh, earlier this week, we released a new brief which outlines different ways in which uh, governments might choose to uh, recover uh, from the learning loss issues that have um, affected children in their countries. And this is based on extensive consultation with leading experts uh, globally, a review of the evidence to come up with uh, evidence-based suggestions on uh, for policymakers in this area. So today, uh, we're going to start with a, a brief presentation of the main findings of that uh, brief uh, presented by uh, Milan Thomas. And then we'll have a panel discussion with policymakers or policy people um, from different regions of Asia. So let me start by introducing uh, Milan Thomas, who will do the presentation. And then after that, uh, before we start the panel discussion, I will introduce uh, the members of the panel. So Milan Thomas is an economist in the uh, research department of ADB. Uh, he has nearly a decade of experience in the design, implementation, and evaluation of innovative development projects uh, from working uh, with Results for Development Institute in DC, USAID, the World Bank, and now ADB as a young professional. He holds a PhD in economics at Georgetown. So Milan, please go ahead. Thank you, Albert. Um, so we're, we're going to start uh, the day off by um, setting the stage for the panel by spending a few minutes describing losses from school closures and then go through evidence-backed recovery approaches that are being attempted all over the world. And as Albert said, this is uh, based on a very recent ADB brief, number 217, which you can uh, find online. It just went up this week. Um, so school closures are, are winding down after over two years, uh, but their damage could be long lasting. Uh, closures worsened a learning crisis that existed before the pandemic. In, in 2019, 57% of children in middle and low income countries couldn't read a simple text by age 10. And the World Bank projects that that number has since jumped to 70%. School closures led to learning loss. And by that, we mean students learned less than they would have had schools stayed physically open. ADB's research department earlier this year estimated what the economic costs of those learning losses would be if no remedial actions were taken. And we did that using national data on closures, estimates of remote instruction efficacy, data on internet access, and uh, labor market data. In developing Asia, the projected losses are equivalent to about half a year of learning adjusted schooling. And this foregone learning will hurt students' ability to earn income as adults. Their projected losses in lifetime earnings are over $3.2 trillion. And that's a conservative projection uh, for reasons that you can uh, learn more about in the 2022 Asian Development Outlook. Those are our aggregate projections, but uh, it's important to note that poor students and girls were especially uh, hard hit by school closures. And that's because those two groups had less access to remote instruction during the pandemic, as well as a greater tendency to be pulled out of school uh, in response to economic hardship. Our loss estimates are adjusted to reflect those inequalities uh, and the projected losses are therefore 28% higher for girls than for boys and 47% higher for the poorest uh, students than for the richest students. Everything we shared so far are aggregate projections, but more and more assessments based on actual test scores are becoming available now. 
a recent survey um, of test-based studies is broadly consistent with the projections. The measured losses uh, in learning are several months uh, worth of schooling, even in the most advanced economies. Um, but on the bright side, the gap between where students are uh, and where there would have been without closures is narrowing in parts of Europe uh, where um, schools reopened earlier. And there are also impact evaluations showing that interventions um, have been able to mitigate learning losses in some developing uh, country contexts. That said, only 25% of countries surveyed by UNICEF um, have a solid learning recovery plan. And that lack of planning will make it harder to close the gap for developing countries and ensure that the projections that we shared don't become a reality in developing Asia. So with all this in mind, a joint ADB, ADI, ADBI team um, put together this brief with an evidence-based set of approaches for resetting in-person learning. And it's based on a literature review and consultation with global education experts. Um, it's not just about learning, um, learning loss recovery. It's, it's also about addressing the learning crisis by reorienting what happens inside of classrooms. Okay, so before, before we get into the uh, broad approaches, we note two enabling factors that are the starting points uh, for any recovery strategy. The first is periodic assessment of uh, learning. And that means testing students to determine uh, where to restart lessons, among many other decisions that need to be made. Um, the second is pre-service and in-service teacher training. Teachers need to be trained in the skills necessary for delivering the approaches to learning recovery, uh, which we now share in the form of this diagram. So th this diagram has at its core three boxes in yellow. And these yellow boxes are not mutually exclusive approaches, nor are they necessarily exhaustive. It's just a broad classification of approaches that are aligned with the objective of learning recovery. And I think that you'll find that these approaches are thankfully um, logical and obvious. If you imagine that you were in charge of a construction project, let's say it's a, it's a, home, uh, a home construction project, you're bu building a house um, and, and you face serious delays and you had to find a way to meet your original deadline, you basically have three options. You could scale back the size of the house to make it more doable in a short amount of time. You could strengthen uh, your workforce either by hiring more workers or training the workers to be faster. You could simply pay the workers over time to complete the task um, in the allotted time, or you could do some combination of the three. And those are roughly analogous to the approaches identified in this diagram. But of course, we're building uh, a foundation for future livelihood instead of, uh, instead of an actual building. Um, so here you see the yellow boxes are courses of action to recover learning. The white boxes are specifics of how to implement the, the, white, the yellow boxes. And the green boxes are enabling factors for the yellow and the white boxes. Um, so let's start, uh, let's go from left to right. Uh, let's start with consolidating the curriculum. This involves setting priorities to decide uh, what lessons are essential for later learning. And this could be decided by a committee of experts. Indeed, over half of, um, half of countries surveyed by UNICEF have done some form of curriculum consolidation. A second approach is targeted instruction, which has strong evidence behind it. Uh, you may also know this as teaching at the right level, and it's an approach that showed great promise in developing countries before the pandemic. There's a spectrum of targeted ins uh, instruction options. At one extreme, you have no targeting. Uh, a teacher just teaches to an age group with no consideration for the student's individual learning needs. And this is uh, most ineffective when there are large learning differences within a classroom. At the other extreme, you have personalized instruction with full customization to each student's needs. And this is of course uh, not very feasible in practice. Even in the richest private schools in the world, they don't have this, the time or the staff uh, that are needed to do extended uh, personal instruction. But there are effective, feasible, and proven solutions uh, that fall in between these two extremes. There's group targeting. Students can uh, be divided based on their initial knowledge with teachers reassigned accordingly. Um, alternatively, lessons could be customized for a few learning groups within a classroom uh, with the help of teaching assistants. There's also um, individual targeting that can be done feasibly using ed tech as support for teachers. 
So computer assisted learning can deliver lessons that allow students to learn at their own pace. Um, cost effective mobile tutoring has also improved learning in several South Asian countries. Um, and then finally, as the, the third approach, uh, hours of instruction can be increased. This can be more hours per day, a longer school week, uh, a shorter break between terms, and this gives students time to cover the material that they missed out on. Uh, many countries, in fact, have, have chosen this kind of adjustment um, on their return to in-person classes. For some countries, uh, the work can't stop there because another component of recovery has to be bringing students who dropped out of school back into the classroom. Um, there were over 250 million out of school youth before the pandemic. There are no official uh, estimates of the current number, but we know that that number has increased and unfortunately substantially so in some countries, uh, especially in Africa. So in addition to social safety nets, information campaigns can publicize the reforms to help uh, dropouts reintegrate and uh, in so doing make a return to schooling more appealing and at the same time less daunting. So to conclude, in any given country, the three complementary approaches that we uh, discussed could be combined in a cohesive recovery strategy. Some of the approaches we talked about are more labor intensive, like uh, extending hours or hiring more TAs. Others are more capital intensive, like using ed tech. And the right mix uh, of these approaches really depends on what resources are available and what the unique country circumstances are. So next, uh, Chief Economist Albert Park is going to lead uh, a very distinguished panel that's working at the forefront of this issue. And we're all looking forward to their practical discussion of how learning recovery strategies are taking shape in Asia. Thanks, Milan, for that great introduction. Um, so uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, three experts um, uh, to talk about the practical uh, issues related to implementing approaches uh, to recovering learning loss. Uh, so uh, let me uh, let me introduce them very briefly. Uh, the first uh, uh, panelist is uh, Karma Galay, who is the officiating secretary of the Royal Government of Bhutan's Ministry of Education. Um, uh, Mr. Galay has experience as a chief research officer, so he's thought very deeply about issues related to education uh, and holds a master's degree from Stanford University. Our second panelist is Franco Rodi, uh, who is the permanent secretary for the Solomon Islands, Solomon Islands Ministry of Education and Human Resources Development, a position he's held since 2014. Uh, Dr. Rodi, uh, before he worked at the Ministry of Education, was a teacher in secondary school teaching science, uh, so has personal experience of the challenges facing teachers, and holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Education from the University of Waikato in New Zealand. And finally, our third speaker is Gisun uh, Song, who is uh, the Director of the Human and Social Development Division of ADB's South Asia Department. Uh, she has been working on a variety of education, skills development, and health projects in Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka uh, since 2011, and she holds a PhD from Bonn University in Germany. Uh, so with that, let's get to the discussion. I thought I would start by asking each of the panelists to just introduce uh, briefly how the pandemic affected uh, learning by students in their country or region, um, and what efforts were made to support students learning when schools were closed, and what was the experience in terms of what types of uh, approaches uh, were most effective in supporting uh, students during that challenging time. And after we do this round of questions, then we'll start talking about the, the methods to uh, recover learning loss in the countries. Uh, so maybe I can start with um, Mr. Galay. Do you want to say a few words? Uh, sure, Mr. Park. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning from Bhutan. It's a privilege and honor for me to take part in this uh, very, very prestigious webinar. Uh, 
Uh, good morning also to the fellow panelists and good morning to everyone who's, who are in the webinar. Uh, I don't have a prepared presentation as such. I have some scribbles here and there in my notes. So if I ramble along the way, please forgive me. Uh, I say this also largely because I'm quite new to education, despite Park's introduction uh, as a, a chief researcher in the past. My research areas were not in education as such. I was working as maybe in some other sector. So I'm quite new to this area, but it's such an honor and privilege for me, as I said, uh, to take part in this discussion. And now to get to the question that was asked uh, uh, of what happened during the pandemic uh, and what were the things that we did, uh, I'd like to start by saying that uh, in Bhutan, the first case of COVID-19 was detected on 5th of March, 2020, uh, in a tourist who was visiting us here, an American tourist. And as soon as that, was, that happened, <clears throat> schools in and around the capital city that tourist was in Th in Thimpu, the capital city at that time so the schools in three districts three districts of Thimpu, paro and uh, punaka they were all closed they were all closed for two weeks and a lot of things a lot of uh, assessments were happening then we were hoping that by two weeks the schools would probably reopen but on march 18 as as the realities of covid 19 sank in deeper uh, we were told to close. All the schools nationwide were asked to be closed, ordered to be closed. So beginning March 18, all the schools at national level were closed. Uh, this, uh, this closure brought a lot of inconveniences, a lot of learning losses to the people, to the students. The students could no longer go to school, but they could no longer uh, get this contact teaching from the teachers. Uh, so I think it was a lot, a lot of inconveniences were brought into the students. <clears throat> especially in terms of uh, loss, uh, lack of face-to-face -face teaching. So, uh, but the Ministry of Education then was very aware that this probably may not go away and immediately came up with a plan, with the plan to respond. With the number of responses, uh, uh, the plan was put forward. So, uh, uh, so in order to ensure that uh, learning losses were very minimal at best, or there were no learning losses at all, Ministry put together a set of plans. Uh, first one was, of course, I mean, the pandemic had uh, just, uh, uh, the, there was only one case then. So a lot of awareness programs and the importance of having to keep and maintain your hygiene were conducted in terms of uh, having to wash your hands, in terms of having to wear your, uh, uh, wear masks and wash your hands and uh, to do regular uh, uh, hygiene. A lot of this awareness and advocacy was carried out in the first. Then also we realized that it may not go away soon because we were hearing from across the world that it was getting worse. So we knew that the schools may be off for a while. So immediately Ministry of Education worked on the curriculum for education in emergencies. They came up with a curriculum, which pretty much was called adapted curriculum. They worked on this adapted curriculum from PP to six. It was pretty much focused on literacy and numeracy and for Grades uh, seven to 12, uh, they have some elements of theme-based learning. Uh, then curriculum implementation guidelines were issued to the teachers. A uh, lot of these wash facilities were uh, uh, water, uh, sanitation and other hygiene facilities were uh, developed in the schools. If there is ever a other side to this COVID-19, the positive aspect of COVID-19, I think our schools really benefited in terms of having so many of these wash facilities put up. Uh, then, uh, then this, uh, as I mentioned, there was this curriculum, the adapted curriculum and other uh, revised curriculum. Uh, this, uh, we wanted the curriculum, the revised curriculum to get to our students. So we also, when we invited teachers, uh, ministry officials and other experts were invited to make videos. Around 440 videos uh, based on these lessons were made and broadcast through our national television <clears throat> so that the students could listen uh, to the programs and catch up with the learning. Uh, then then the, there were also these teachers, especially the teachers who were teaching these uh, lower levels of grades. Uh, they were also asked to use social media. So social media group in terms of uh, WhatsApp and WeChat and Telegram, connecting teacher and students, connecting teacher, students and parents. Uh, so many of these were developed and used by our teachers. Then for higher grades, we introduced the Google Classes system. We encourage our teachers to use Google Classes. Teachers were trained on how to use Google Class and conduct classes in the Google Classrooms. So that was one. 
uh, but uh, these were very, very digitally oriented interventions. Uh, and as all of us know, I, I hope, hopefully, all of us, all of the people who are attending the webinar know about Bhutan. Our geography is quite challenging here. I mean, we are very, very mountainous country. So uh, although we have the televisions uh, broadcasting uh, our lessons, uh, although we had uh, radio programs and other things, and although there were these internet classes, teachers conducting, conducting classes in Google classrooms, uh, there are also many students who were not able to access this because they were in far away places, far flung villages, remote corners. So, <clears throat> Ministry of Education then came up with uh, uh, self-instruction materials. We developed these very, very targeted uh, uh, materials for students uh, to self-instruct themselves. Uh, and they were distributed uh, to uh, different parts of the country. I think around 36,000 students uh, availed this uh, self-instruction materials. And as I said, radio lessons were also aired and uh, and we also knew that during such difficult times, uh, there would be people who would go through stress, uh, people who would be facing difficulties. So we also opened up helplines, set up helplines for people to able uh, psychosocial support. Our counselors were working around the clock and giving advices on people uh, to people who were having difficulties. Uh, and. Uh, then we also were, we also realized that we have students not just in in the country. There were also students working and studying outside outside the country. We also the Ministry of Education also tried to reach out to the students who were outside and trying to see how they were doing. We uh, if some of them wanted to come back, we were we helped them uh, arrange their travels, uh, uh, counsel them on how to keep themselves sa safe from COVID. Uh, so. Uh, but these were in terms of interventions. And we also knew that the exams had to be conducted. I mean, students, uh, uh, especially those in the higher grades who were sitting for the high stake examinations. So we also organized exams in containment mode. In, the, in, in 2020, uh, when the crisis was not as bad in, as 20, 2021, class 10 and class 12 students, they had their exams in containment mode. And in 2020, 2022, when the, uh, the things were a little bad here, I mean, the number of cases, the positive cases was a little high in 2022, uh, 2021, I mean, we had to also arrange for kids to take exams from the quarantine centers. Every day there were, you know, like buildings that were declared as red, uh, declared as red. And then we had to take uh, students who were residing in these buildings uh, to quarantine centers arranged for the exams from the quarantine centers. Uh, uh, we had teachers who were working as invigilators in these quarantine centers. Uh, they, uh, they, they, uh, they did their duty in full PP years. They were working in PP years without lunch, without tea, in between for eight hours at stretch. So it was quite, uh, quite, uh, quite an exciting thing. And we appreciate the sacrifices these people made, teachers made. And one of the interventions that we did also was uh, to relocate some of the schools. Relocate, uh, we relocated many schools from the south, which were south uh, part of the country borders with India. So the cases in India were also going up and there were chances that uh, uh, the students who were studying in the bordering areas, uh, we thought they were much more susceptible. Uh, so we re relocated them to the uh, schools up in the north. We went to the extent of buying private structures to accommodate these students who were relocated. So uh, exams were conducted in containment mode and in 2021, we conducted them in quarantine mode. Uh, 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 so, so I think these are a few interventions that we so far carried out. Uh, okay. And uh, in, right now the schools are in full uh, normal mode, functioning in normal mode right now. So yeah. I, I was wondering well, there were running losses, but uh, I think uh, we have managed to cope and we have managed to address the concerns of uh, children. We're worried that the learning losses uh, uh, should be uh, as minimal as possible. And we're doing our best right now. Uh, can I ask you, how long were schools closed completely? And when did they fully reopen? Uh, in 2020, I think it was off and on. But overall, I think maybe at the, uh, uh, at the, in terms of learning losses from PP to 8, there were about five months of uh, closure. All, all together, and at the higher level, because we opened in the, uh, sometimes as and whenever the situation improved, we opened the schools. So at the 
grade nine to 12 level, maybe they lost just about uh, 31 days of instructional hours. So it wasn't really much. Uh, things were bad, maybe in the South, then the schools up in the North started functioning. I mean, they kept functioning. Uh, uh, so in terms of loss, even in 2020, uh, it wasn't much. In 2021, we relocated all the schools and schools mostly function in containment mode. So not much of learning loss was there. In, then. Okay, Th thanks so much. I'm gonna turn it to um, uh, Mr. Rohde yeah. to talk about- Thank you, thank you so much. In Solomon Islands. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the op opportunity to uh, contribute to the discussion. I'm going to be brief so that I'm within the time that I'm uh, allocated. So to respond to the question, the first part of the question asked about how the pandemic affected learning by students in my country. So here I'm talking about the Solomon Islands, which is uh, found in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so uh, what happened was in 2020, when we heard about the pandemic and it was spreading all over the world, uh, we began our preparation um, by devising what we call the COVID-19 uh, pandemic preparation and response plan. And so what, the, what our government did was to, uh, well, we, we closed our schools. So in 2020, the schools were closed for three months. All our students were uh, sent back to their, school, uh, to their villages uh, uh, and in the provinces. So during that time, uh, all government uh, ministries, as well as uh, uh, the Ministry of Education, uh, we were devising our plans so that you know we can we can prepare ourselves for the worst uh, that is yet yet to come. And um, our student came back uh, after being away for three months, and so they had uh, less time uh, for to to. Uh, for learning, uh, and so it was quite difficult in, in terms of uh, school starting at the exact dates. But finally, they settled down, and so they were back to you know the normal classroom uh, environment, and they were learning. And then at the beginning of this year, um, that is around January 19, that is when our country first recorded um, COVID-19 community transmission. And so we had to close our school from January up until uh, June. So that was five months of schooling lost. So some of the impacts that uh, the COVID-19 has had on our students' learning include, you know, the students' welfare, they were affected psychologically, uh, they were anxious about you know, when the schools would start, and as a result, they were worrying about uh, whether they would be able to complete their education. And so, but you know, they, they, uh, our students were with their parents for, for five months uh, until we opened the schools uh, at the beginning of this month. So when, when our schools were closed, and because we had our COVID-19 prepar uh, preparedness and the uh, response plan, uh, my ministry was able to help schools in terms of um, the learning that we expected uh, at the, at the schools, uh, I mean, in, in the schools, uh, so that they can continue. And so we had this uh, program called Learning Continuity Program, whereby we in the ministry had free uh, record of lessons and they were broadcasted um, through our national radio. And so those students who were able to access uh, the radio uh, programs were able to listen 
to the, the to the to the lessons which were uh, of 30 minutes uh, duration. So we prepared lessons for uh, the ECE primary and secondary schools. At the same time, we also provided um, digitalized uh, curriculum materials in our I resources website. And so those who were able to tap into our resources were able to access those, those materials. But the difficult thing is that you know they were in their villages with their parents, and so um, they were a bit struggling in terms of supervision of the students so that they can uh, concentrate on uh, on the what they were expected to learn, uh, and so that was quite difficult. Um, in terms of the second question that you raised. And then I, I will stop. Um, what efforts uh, were made to support students' learning? Uh, I've talked about you know, the learning continuity program that we put out through our radio program, as well as uh, the online facility or platform. Uh, but to, to us, the one, uh, the lessons that we broadcasted uh, probably had the biggest uh, impact. Now I'm saying probably because we are currently uh, assessing uh, the, the impact that, uh, you know, uh, the support that we provided through radio uh, uh, have had on our students. Uh, but again, in terms of online um, learning that students were engaged, engaged in, we had difficulty especially for students who were living at the time in the rural areas where they don't have connectivity uh, to the online pl platform. So that was a, 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 that was difficult for them. Uh, I, I'll stop here and then probably later on, I might be able to continue with some of the th uh, things that we did to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on our students. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. And finally, Kisun, do you want to say a few words? I know you don't have to uh, talk about every single country. I mean, that wouldn't be take too much time, but maybe you could uh, uh, provide some context in South Asia. Yeah, um, thank you very much. And then thank you for inviting me for this. And then it's, it's a, a, like a very good opportunity to also learn from other reasons as well. Um, we, like a South Asia actually is a home for um, like a large number of students. Uh, most of the country is actually quite young in demographics and and like uh, the the COVID actually affected 247 million students in, in India and then 37 million students in Bangladesh alone, in addition to other uh, neighboring countries. So the number itself is quite staggering. And then um, while like uh, as Milan uh, included in his presentation, these issues on like a learning deficit was not a new thing to these countries. Um, there has been discussion on the learning crisis for the last decade. And uh, there also has been a lot of like a uh, remedial measures has been discussed and, and uh, piloted in, in many ways. Um, so we kind of see that COVID certainly exacerbated the, the learning deficit, but we see this is a case of like a someone who is chronically ill is attacked by some pandemic and then further exacerbating the, the health status. It's like a same analogy. The, the education system was already ailing with the learning deficit. And then it is actually with the COVID and the school closure the lifeline of like a continuous learning opportunities it, it is deprived uh, from many students. So not only just like uh, academic learning, uh, as Mr. Rudy mentioned, the social emotional aspects is also important. And then in many of uh, South Asia countries, this is also directly related to the physical health and well-being of the students because many schools uh, actually being uh, providing school meals, midday meals for students. 
So for especially from the families um, with the with the low level income, and then um, the students actually getting school meal, it was like a very important aspect for the, their nutritional uh, support. So this is like a little bit underreported, uh, but I think that the direct impact on the health status of the students, especially from the lower income families is, is also an area that we should really look at carefully. As like a Mr. Rudy and Mr. Gale kind of uh, mentioned uh, in South Asia countries, including Bhutan, They've been actually trying many different things uh, to overcome this learning crisis. So I, I feel like um, kind of uh, some green, uh, like a silver lining in the cloud um, that we can actually gather from the COVID pandemic is actually the kind of innovations and, and uh, the, the measures being taken uh, out of urgency actually have some um, potentials to overcome this long-standing uh, learning deficit. And that we see this actually typically affected by the lack of resources and capacity and also like a political will and motivation. Given the education systems are all along very colossal, uh, uh, very traditionally uh, oriented system, having this experience of like a very, uh, try to address the problem in a kind of agile way and piloting something and uh, try to assess the, the impact and the moving on to the next stage. I think this like experience itself is very valuable for the policymakers and that we would like to actually um, encourage that and reinforce that with, uh, with our programs as well. I'll just stop here for the next questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, those are really good points that the impacts are not just about learning, but uh, multidimensional um, and uh, thinking about it as an opportunity uh, for innovation. I think that's also uh, an important point. Of course, South Asia, from our our own research, you know, is a region where the school closures were longer than in other regions of Asia and other re many other regions in the world. So the, the challenges are particularly uh, pronounced. Um, OK, let's go to another round of questions and start to talk about uh, the recovery plans. And uh, before I do that, I, I do want to remind our viewing yeah. audience to please ask questions in the Q&A, because after this next round of questions, I hope we'll have some time to uh, ask some of the questions uh, from the audience. Um, so uh, I want to ask um, our panelists what the current plans are for uh, learning recovery. Uh, in some cases, those plans may already have been uh, started to be implemented because kids may already be back to school. Um, and I'm also wondering if you had any reactions to some of the approaches that Milan had described as possibilities, whether, whether you think those are good suggestions, not appropriate for your country, any thoughts that you might have, uh, I think would be uh, very interesting for us to, to, to think about. I mean, one thing I wanted to emphasize is that one, one very robust finding about research to date on learning loss is that the impact of the pandemic was highly uneven, that it, it, it's led to a situation where the differences or the inequalities in learning levels are much bigger than they were even before the crisis, um, before the pandemic, and they were already uh, quite pronounced then. And so that's why uh, we're particularly emphasizing uh, these approaches that try to teach at the right level for each student, or at least consider that because we know there's gonna be big differences in how uh, students um, were affected by the pandemic. So with that, let me go back around and turn back to uh, Mr. Galay, and maybe you can say a few words about um, what, uh, what the approach has been uh, in Bhutan. Sure, sure, Pat, thank you. Uh, also to maybe like, uh, tell and share something that I missed that time in terms of interventions that we carried out during the pandemic. Uh, one of the interventions that we carried out was uh, uh, in terms of uh, negotiating on behalf of the students with the telecom uh, companies here, internet companies, because everyone was required to learn through the, uh, uh, using mobiles, uh, using internet. There were people who were complaining that it was costing their families a bit 
So Ministry of Education negotiated with these two internet companies here, and we were able to uh, uh, able about 60% discount for the students. We collected the numbers of the students, uh, the mobile numbers of the students, we registered around 150,000 students availed these services. So even this, uh, this, this discount facilities is still available. The students are availing it. That was one. And then also, I think I forgot to mention about our teachers who were uh, visiting students at home, following up with the self-instruction uh, materials. Many teachers drove to remote villages. Many teachers walked, uh, risked their lives uh, uh, because mo most of the time they were traveling, it was monsoon, you know, like rivers were flooding, uh, rainy. So teachers visited their students at home, their remote villages, and followed up as to how they were doing. So these are a few interventions I thought I missed. Uh, now coming to these uh, few uh, activities that we are doing now, I mean, things are almost back to normal in Bhutan. I think that's the good news. I think for us, uh, the school started way back in April. It's about four, four months since the schools have started. And uh, when the schools were re resuming from break last year, uh, and also from the closure, we sent out circulars. Uh, we sent out notifications to our principals and teachers asking them to do the bridging programs. We instructed the schools that at least a, a month should be dedicated to uh, make, uh, bridging programs and making up for the losses from the previous uh, closures. Uh, so I think most of our schools uh, spent about a month, uh, the first month, trying to understand what were the learning losses uh, uh, each of the students had, and then trying to make up for these classes. Uh, they organized classes, special classes, but at personal level. I mean, this was also a personalized level. So uh, uh, these this were done. And now, I mean, I, I think in, the, uh, in 2020, when the COVID uh, pandemic first uh, hit us here, our curriculum was prioritized. Uh, it was reduced by about 35%. It was reduced by about 35%. And that was what I think Milan was mentioning, Thomas was mentioning as one of the recommendations that was implemented during the COVID. And now that the schools are back in full swing, this curriculum, which has been prioritized, is now formalized and it's been labeled as the national school curriculum. So the curriculum that is uh, now being studied is uh, about 35% less. But in terms of content, in terms of concept, uh, uh, I don't think there is any loss. Uh, people have only, the, uh, only I think, shredded and uh, made sure that whatever was uh, not required, uh, where they were, wherever there were duplications, these have been left out. So this has been now made as national school curriculum. And uh, we have our teachers, uh, uh, because they were also disrupted and we could not have regular interactions with them. We have uh, also developed the instructional guides for use of this uh, new curriculum. And these instructional guides have been sent to them. Uh, and currently, we are uh, training our teachers on the use of this new curriculum, teaching of this new curriculum. We have uh, completed recently about uh, training 6,000 teachers so far, and we have a few more to go, a few thousand more to go. So these are a few things happening. And as also was mentioned in Milan's presentation, uh, Saturdays classes have been restored. We are requiring our schools to have classes on Saturdays. And we have also reduced the summer break. Summer breaks usually are one month. And this time around, we reduce them to uh, we reduce them to one week, one week because uh, uh, we want to make sure that our kids, uh, uh, if they have, uh, many of them have lost learning, so we want them to make sure uh, uh, have time to make up for the losses they have from the previous year. So these are a few things happening, and then also I think this uh, uh, the, if, uh, uh, we have learned a lot that uh, the technology is very important during the COVID and pandemic time. So now blended learning has almost become a regular uh, uh, practice here in Bhutan. In the schools, we're uh, asking our teachers to do classroom teaching as well as also teach the students through technology. Uh, most of the assignments now are assigned through the technology, I mean, through Google Classrooms and also using this uh, social uh, uh, media like WhatsApp and WeChat. So these are a few things happening right now. I mean, like a uh, uh, good thing is, as I said, I mean, we're back to normal here. All the classes, all the schools are functioning right now. Uh, in a week or two's time, our midterms will be, uh, the schools will be going in for the midterms and they will have uh, a week's holiday and then they will resume again. So this time around, we are, we are quite uh, doing fine. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to Mr. Rohde to, to uh, yeah, talk about- quickly. 
there are three key things that I'd like to share with you in terms of uh, what we are doing uh, now that our schools are back. Sorry, our schools are open and our children are in the classroom. So the first task that we did at the ministry was to review our school calendar so that we can cater for the time that is left. So from our 40 weeks, sorry, 40, um, um, we, 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 no, we normally have 40 uh, weeks of uh, school. We have cut it down to 28 weeks. So that is the first thing that we did to instruct or advise our schools, particularly principals and teachers, that this time, you know, they would have only 28 weeks to cover the curriculum. The second key thing that we did was to review the examination uh, um, uh, specification, particularly for our examination classes. So we do have examinations. These are national examinations that students start at year nine, year 11, and year 12. So what my ministry has done, particularly the examination uh, department, uh, assessment department rather, was to uh, draft um, what we call a uh, examination uh, prescription, uh, which outline the key topics uh, and uh, the learning outcomes that will, that will be the focus of our examination uh, this year. A third thing that we did and we are currently doing is to conduct a survey to ascertain um, some of the challenges, issues that uh, our teachers are uh, experiencing uh, when they commence, recommence uh, classes in their schools in terms of how they might be supported with uh, students' behavior and the demand to cover uh, the, the, the curriculum until the end of the uh, school term that is uh, in December. So for the normal classes, those do not have national examinations, we have provided you know, some guidance on those foundational skills uh, related to the subjects that are taught so that they could be able to cover them uh, in the remaining uh, time that uh, they're going to uh, have classes. Um, the support that we, uh, we would like to provide to students, sorry, teachers in particular, uh, with the challenges that they face is something that is ongoing in terms of professional development on those key areas. So looking at the presentation that we had at the beginning of uh, our session, uh, I, 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 I can understand and, and the need for us to um, review those so that you know, we can be able to implement them in our schools as a way to recover student learning loss. So those are some of the things that uh, we have been doing and we continue to do uh, as we progress uh, this year. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Gisun, do you wanna comment? Uh, thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned that the issues are like a kind of more longer term underlying uh, issues that um, our kind of education interventions and supporting uh, different countries in the South Asia uh, has been uh, working like a, try to resolve like a, some of these like uh, enabling environment. So when Milan actually presented the, the diagram with a lot of boxes, we're actually undertaking a lot of interventions around those boxes. But now like uh, our um, kind of teams, like uh, effort is actually being made, how we can actually strike the balance between this immediate learn, uh, remedial actions versus like uh, linking that to longer term uh, reform uh, agenda because we have to make these initiatives more sustainable and have a sustained impact on the learning uh, improvement so that the, the, the perennial learning deficit 
actually, or the the degrading uh, learning gains can be actually um, over time. And we see that, um, the, of course, like a COVID and then like a Bangladesh or India has been like a running the school closure, like a, almost like a top level uh, in the world, that it, it is certainly worrying, but at the same time, compared to the real underlying, like uh, the existing learning deficit, maybe like uh, it's just adding like a further, yeah. But we see this as a kind of positive aspect is really bringing a lot of people's attention. And then we try to leverage uh, leverage those like uh, the high level of attention to actually push some of the uh, key reform agendas. So this curriculum reform has been very important agenda. And then uh, uh, what actually Bhutan uh, has done, uh, rationalizing and then really uh, prioritizing the key uh, competences and, and focusing on that is very important aspects. And, the, like, uh, and then preparing the teachers and then training teachers in service um, really like uh, make the differences in the classroom uh, teaching and learning uh, uh, is is very important area and then introducing and str strengthening the formative assessment so that the starting point in like a Milan's like a top level uh, box like a understanding uh, where the, the students are and then how that can actually feed into the policy um, that's also a very important area. And then um, the, the in increasing school hours has been also on agenda. Um, but again, I do not want to highlight those challenges, how to implement this. Um, they, they do have a challenges. These are, as I mentioned, the resource capacity and the system issues. And, and um, but with the, with the learnings like uh, we have and then the experience uh, last two years, we hope like uh, we can drive some of the positive changes in, in those areas. Thank you. Great, thanks. So um, one point I think uh, that you make, which is important is linking the attempts to recover learners to uh, more systemic reform of the educational systems. And one thing I think that was learned in the pandemic is that there are quite a lot, of, a lot of opportunities to mobilize community resources and parental resources to help contribute to supporting the learning of students, because that often became the only channel to provide direct support to students. And there's really no reason why that can't continue, um, uh, even when uh, schools are uh, back open. And the other thing, I, I visited Madhya Pradesh uh, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I think, and uh, the the permanent secretary of education in the state, uh, one thing she thought that was um, really helpful that they didn't even anticipate how valuable it would be was, was an online kind of teacher training um, activity because they realized that the teachers needed to talk to each other and they presented a lot of short videos and other things to teach, help teachers do very specific things um, and also for teachers to talk to. And they thought this was really incredible for teachers that it never really existed before. And so that kind of thing also, I think could sustain beyond um, just uh, the remediation period. Um, so we have some questions in the, we have a few minutes left. We have some questions um, in the Q&A. One of the questions is, how much of the learning loss can actually be recovered? <laughs> and um, I wanna link this to the point that uh, Gisun made about assessment, that for improving formative assessment is important. Um, and some of the comments uh, made uh, by um, our uh, education ministers <laughs> about the efforts. I'm wondering if you have been doing any testing to actually figure out how big the learning losses were or whether the efforts that you had done to try to reduce learning loss were effective to answer this question about how much can be recovered or, or are these kids still very far behind um, in, in the two contexts. And in particular, you know, it, it sounds like um, in 
uh, in Solomon Islands, there was a lot of reliance on radio broadcasts, but the evidence that I've seen from other countries is that radio broadcasts were not very effective um, during the pandemic. So I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts on that or any evidence uh, on that. Um, so let me, um, maybe I can turn it back to, uh, uh, to um, Mr. Galay and then, uh, and then also uh, Mr. Rohde to comment briefly, please, because we don't have much time. So just take a minute or so, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Park. Uh, in terms of these uh, points that were pointed out or alluded to by Jisung, uh, I'd like to say that we are also going through this massive education reform in the country right now. And as Jisung mentioned, I mean, it's important that whatever was introduced during this pandemic, the lessons that we have learned become sustainable. So one of these lessons, if ever there is, is this, as I mentioned earlier, is also the use of digital technology. I think there is this, uh, we realize that digitalization of education is really, really important. So currently we're working on, uh, as part of the education reform, in developing a learning management system. Learning management system, which will have materials for teachers, which will have materials for parents, which will also have materials for students. Uh, these are some of the things that will be developed here. Some of the materials will be curated from elsewhere and uh, uh, uploaded on this. Uh, then the teachers and students can uh, have connections through this learning management system. The parents can be brought in. So this is uh, what we are focusing on right now. Uh, we realize that uh, 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 digitalization is very important. So these are a few things that we're doing right now as uh, something which is going to be sustainable. And I think we also need to be also aware of the fact that we need to keep changing every once in a while. We need to be agile and nimble enough to uh, uh, respond to the changes that are happening really, really fast. So I think unless we go digital, I mean, the changes are go not going to be, I mean, we're not going to be uh, responsive enough, uh, agile enough to respond. So this, I thought maybe a useful point to share for now is to what is happening in Bhutan. Uh, we are seriously concerned that uh, 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 kids should not uh, lose uh, in terms of their learning. Uh, in terms of, you were asking a question as to, I mean, uh, a question from the, uh, the participants as to whether or, or how much of learning loss will be actually recovered. I would like to say that in Bhutan, there has not been much of learning losses actually. I mean, we have undertaken so many interventions. Thanks to these interventions, in 2020, when we had these high stack exams for the 10th and 12th grade, we had one of the best results. <laughs> Although kids could not attend classes regularly, the results were really like colorful, really good. So I, I'm not really sure, I mean, our, if our kids uh, really uh, uh, lost so much of their learning. Although it will not be very true to say that they did not lose learning at all. So uh, for us, Great. we are fairly yeah, comfortable, fairly comfortable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Rohde? Yeah, very quickly, uh, in, in terms of how you affect your radio is, uh, I totally agree with you that, you know, uh, it may not be effective. Uh, you know, we cannot re replace teachers uh, at homes where parents are sort of supervising the students to ensure that they learn the, that stuff that is being broadcasted. So that's why we are now uh, concentrating on online learning uh, so that we can be able to strengthen or make available those uh, uh, materials that the students might have, uh, although the, the the pandemic may be over now, not over yet, but you know, all those students are fine. In, in terms of uh, student learning loss, uh, how much they may have lost and how much can we they gain? Our experience has shown that you know, uh, even though the schools were closed last year, it's not last year, 2020, for three months, getting right to schools. Uh, was quite difficult. And so the national examination results show uh, dropout, I mean, a slightly reduction in the number of students uh, uh, taking the, the examinations. And we've seen that uh, the performance of some of our students, particularly in mathematics, have, have dropped. And that is a concern to us. Uh, so of course, the, the pandemic and the close, long, uh, closure of schools have had uh, an impact on student learning. So that, that is all I can share with you. Thank you. Right. Uh, so I apologize we have some other questions, but we're out of time. Unfortunately, we're at the hour. 
Uh, so I'm going to close off uh, today's webinar here. I want to thank the participants. I think it's very encouraging to hear how um, how concerned and proactive the education ministries have been in addressing the incredible challenges posed by the pandemic and all of the good work um, that uh, ADB Operations is also doing to try to really support uh, improved learning in uh, member countries. And I think we... You know, we're, we're going to have to keep studying these issues. There's going to be a lot of lessons to learn from uh, what happened during the pandemic and what happens now as we recover and adopt new methods. Um, and so uh, we will try to keep, uh, keep following these issues, keep conducting research on these issues, and share the experience so that everyone uh, can benefit from uh, the learning as it occurs. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for attending. Uh, the last thing I want to do is uh, inform everyone about the next uh, Asian Impact webinar. So uh, the next one is going to be our key indicators uh, report launch, key indicators for Asia and the Pacific. This is one of our key flagship products, and the details are here. It'll be occurring on August 24th at 1030 in the morning. Uh, I will try to copy the comments in the Q&A and forward it to our uh, panelists in case they want to uh, respond later. Uh, so thank you uh, very much, everybody. And uh, good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>